Hi friends, thanks again for welcoming me into your time, your place, your home, your car, your work, wherever this, wherever you may be for this Sunday's sermon. And um, let's, do, let's have a brief moment of prayer, friends. Amazing God, I thank you again that we can come together in this way, that we can learn more about you, your word, and your ways. And I just ask that you humble our minds and our hearts to your will and to your ways, that we, we may be more like you in these moments and after these moments especially. And we ask all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, let's move on with this Sunday's sermon. Hey friends, let's talk about Paul for a minute before we dive into our scripture reading. We're going to talk about Paul, Saint Paul, the Apostle Paul, and before Paul was Paul, Saul of Tarsus. When Paul was Saul, he was brought up as a Pharisee, so he knew and appreciated the Hebrew Bible in many Hebrew traditions very much. As a Pharisee, Paul believed in life after death, at least in some way, and that may be where we see in Paul's writings such beautiful and mysterious language surrounding our own mortality, but also our imperishability that we can have in life everlasting through Jesus Christ. Paul, however, no matter how we shape him, was a student of the law. And when he was Saul, law was life. During the rise of the Christian movement, and especially after the death of Jesus, and after the resurrection of Jesus, which Paul, when he was Saul, would consider a rumor and a lie, Paul devoted his time to preaching against Jesus, against the movement of of Christianity and he committed his time to tracking down disciples and maybe even partaking in some violent behavior against these Christians some of whom were converted Jews and Paul was not okay with that after all he believed it was all just a lie anyway but on one of Paul's journeys something happens something that would change Saul to Paul would help set the foundation for what Christianity is today and what would help Paul write nearly half of the New Testament. So let's dive into our scripture reading, friends. It comes from Acts 26, 1 through 18. It is a lot of scripture, so strap in. Let's read Acts 26, 1 through 18. So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate, Paul says, that it is before you, King Agrippa. I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O King. Why is it, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, 
brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Let's read that last part again. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me, by faith in Jesus. You know, this was probably a defining moment for Saul. All of, all of Saul's, all of Paul's conversion experience maybe, maybe, could have been dismissed as a hot day. He was dehydrated. He was tired. He drank too much wine. But there are several problems with simply dismissing this incredible moment that we see in other passages that explain this moment. One of the things is Paul may have been the only one to clearly hear the voice and maybe even see Jesus the most clearly, but all of his company either saw the bright and blinding light or heard some sort of sound or both. And Paul himself became blind with scales on his eyes and Jesus called another disciple to meet him, bless him. Paul's eyes were open, the scales fell from his face and then he was baptized in three this was all just pure truth. It was real. It's truth. I want to think of that last line one more time. Open their eyes. Turn from darkness and from Satan to light and God. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. But Paul had a big choice here. Keep living with his old ways, the politics he grew up with, the status that he so diligently pursued and became privileged with, or, and keep blindly believing the lies that he and many have been telling himself, compound those lies brutally on the marginal Christian movement, and spread fear to the lives of anyone who would disobey tradition and law. Or, this is a big or for Paul, allow himself to become transformed to the true ways of God revealed in Jesus Christ, the same person who he has been persecuting. Paul, as rooted and convicted in his belief as he was, knew the truth when it spoke. And that truth was Jesus, crucified to set us free from sin, risen, defeating our death. And even though it seems easier to live a lie for many people in Paul's time, and especially it seems easier for many people in our own time to live a lie, Paul realized what he was really persecuting was truth, and the truth would not be persecuted, but needed to be exposed. And I find it really interesting that when Jesus asks, why are you persecuting me? Paul has no answer. Sometimes we don't. You know, maybe Paul thought, thought of one, thought of an answer in these moments. We don't know how long this moment was, but the more he thought, the more he realized his answer would have just been rooted in lies and selfish ambition, no matter the cost. Maybe this was the moment that he really did try to become reborn from the inside out, realizing that he was tarnishing his soul by upholding the laws in the most wrong of ways because he simply forgot the most important laws of loving God and loving neighbor. It seems, from my perspective, that Paul, before Christ found him, loved the law and tradition more 
than God. And when he placed God second in the words on paper and status and the title first, he found himself living in the dark and living under the power of Satan. And he didn't even know it. Now, thankfully, Paul chooses Jesus. And the works of Paul are countless and amazing. But here, in our scripture reading, just as Paul was persecuting truth itself in Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ, we see Paul and the truth that he is now living in being persecuted. But this leaves us to consider who we are. Maybe there are times that we find ourselves loving our traditions, our rules, our stubborn ways more than God or something God's calling us to. Well, that's an opportunity to allow God to blind us from the shadows that we find ourselves dwelling in so that the light of Christ may illuminate not only our path, but our hearts and our minds. This is an opportunity to ask God to remove the scales from our eyes that have blinded us even if only temporarily, from his ways, truth, life, and love. Maybe there are times when, when other forces or other people come against us while we are working out our faith and works. This is no time to look down and pause, but this is a time to stand fast in our Christian convictions, remember our baptism in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and proclaim the good news, even if just to ourselves, proclaim the good news to ourselves and hopefully to others all the more boldly and diligently. This is a time to yet again, as Jesus said to Paul, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. No matter where we are on our Christian journey, let us not forget to look for Jesus first. And when we look to Jesus, remember that he may be calling you to totally change everything about yourself and what you're doing. Or he may be calling you to stand up in boldness and faith. Maybe a bit of both. I think for Paul, this is where we have some amazing verses, so many amazing verses. Paul knew, and I've said it before, that so often God does not call us into being more comfortable, but has a way of throwing us well out of our comfort zones so that we may transition from something good to something great. We are capable of good by ourselves, but God's calling us down a winding road of greatness. But we have to remember some things, and I'm reminded of two verses from Paul. That I want to leave you with. First verse comes from Ephesians 6 12. This should be a familiar one. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, friends, let us not be overcome by the things of the earth. But to look to God and overcome the darkness as we help all overcome evil, knowing that we have Jesus and Jesus has overcome the world. And the second verse comes from Galatians 2.20. This is one of my favorite verses ever. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So friends, let us not live our own lives, but a life in Christ, because Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And would you please join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Amazing God. Create in us a clean heart that we may love how you love and see how you see. When the busyness 
challenges, and chaos of this world are waging war against our spirit, we ask to be reminded of your peace that passes understanding. When things are going so well that we decide we can handle our days without you, we ask instead to be reminded to look toward you with thanks and to ask for continued blessings. God, we humble ourselves, all of ourselves, mind, body, and soul, to your good and perfect will. Give us now the courage, strength, and confidence to abide in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, go from this time and this place encouraged to change when you must and to be bold when you must. But remember to always look and listen for Jesus first. Peace and love, friends. Amen.